message uh, this morning is payday is coming. Mm. <laughs> now, life has a lot of ups and downs, and you know, sometimes we blame things on the devil and this and that. But I'm going to bring us today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to a clear understanding from God's perspective of what's going on. Yes. From our perspective, all we know is, well, we had a flat tire. It's a bad day. Or the boss is mad because I was late and the whatever. And we get caught up in all sorts of little things, which God has no interest in all the Mickey Mouse things that we do and the things that concern us. He's concerned about us, but he's not concerned about the same things we're concerned about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For several people in this building, this will be the most important sermon you will ever hear in your life. Amen. And I'm not being dramatic, I'm Amen. just telling you. That's right. <laughs> because we're going to discover today what rewards, payments, mm -hmm. punishments, what all this is about. Because most of what we heard growing up was just plain old not true. Mm. We heard that you either go to heaven or hell, yeah. and if you're in heaven, you're just sitting around blissful. <laughs> well, that's not true. Mm. Yeah. There's work to be done. Yes. Mm. God's favorite name for himself is Yahweh Sabaoth, Yahweh, King of the armies of heaven and earth. Amen. So when you're here, you're in an army. Yeah. This is the local division yeah. of God's army. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens in heaven? You're in an army. Mm -hmm. You have a name, rank, serial number, responsibilities, submission to authority. Yes. Just mm -hmm. like you do on earth, only it's in another dimension. Mm -hmm. And the people on that side are working with as angelic beings, they're working with and for people on this side. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. You say, well, will I still be me when I get on the other side? You won't look like you. <laughs> you won't sound like you. You won't act like you did on earth. Oh, Lord. But you will still have the understanding of what happened on earth. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you go over there, you don't forget who you were and where you came from. Amen. Amen. All right? So the Bible clearly has it spelled out for us what's going on here, what's going on there. And I want you to understand there's a scripture that is puzzling to many people. Paul got it from the psalmist David. The scripture says, blessed is the man or woman yeah. to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Mm -hmm. Now impute is an accounting term. Before we had computers, uh, they had a ledger and you wrote down the debts that you owed or the amount you had in the bank. So happy, blessed is the man to whom Yahweh will never put a negative thing on your ledger. Amen. If you're born again in this room, and I hope you are, and I hope it's more than that. There's at least a hundred experiences in God. Being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, that's just two out of a hundred. Yeah. You say, well, just a hundred? Well, okay, maybe there's two hundred. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of things you can experience in God from miracles, dreams, visions, and healings. There's just stuff you can't even imagine. Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I know not. But such a one caught up into the third heaven. Mm -hmm. that, that's a crazy experience. That's wild. That's un unbelievable. That's a mind-boggling, life-changing, dramatic yes. experience. Yes. Well, it's not the new birth, and it's not being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's another experience. And so there are all these experiences that can happen to us. And I trust that you are born again because... We're going to see that there's a great divide between those who are born again. Mm -hmm. What does it mean if you're born again? It means you've asked Christ to be your Savior. Your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. Which sins? Past mm -hmm. sins. Yes. <clears throat> present sins. Mm -hmm. And future sins. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
You say, well, now wait a minute now. What about what about the scripture that says uh, if anyone confesses sins, God is faithful and just to forgive his sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. Well, what does that mean? It means that when you're getting into mischief, you need to say, wait, mm. I know, I'm consciously aware mm. that I'm messing up. Oh, Lord. That's for your benefit. God doesn't write down on the ledger, you are now a sinner, you've done such and such, you committed adultery, robbed a bank, mm. whatever you think the big sins are. If you're born again here today, there's nothing negative that can get on your report card. Amen. And how could God send you to hell if the Holy Spirit lives in you? What is he got to do? Send the Holy Spirit to hell? I think not. Mm. I think not. <laughs> so if you're ever born again and the Holy Spirit's living within you, you can't get unborn again. Amen. You can't lose your salvation because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Mm -hmm. The Bible says it's sealed under the day of redemption. In other words, so you get to the other side. The good news is, if you're born again, there's not anything negative that can go on your report card. Mm -hmm. You can't go to the bank and say, he committed adultery. She stole from the job at work. He did this. She lied. He did. None of that ever gets to your report card. And that's why I stand before you sinless. Mm -hmm. Amen. You say, well, does that mean you can't do anything? No, that's not what that means. I stand before you perfect yeah. and sinless. Yeah. What does that mean? It means my record is clear. Yeah. Clear. Amen. Clear. Amen. clear. Amen. Okay? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Yes. He paid it all. If it's all paid, how can you owe for it? Yeah. Amen. 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 Now, on the flip side, to those who aren't born again, to those who do not have the Holy Spirit living on the inside, the Bible says even the plowing of the wicked is sin. If you're not born again and you mow your lawn, that's a sin. You beat your dog, that's a sin. You cuss your wife, that's a sin. You got a bad attitude towards your boss, that's a sin. Everything you do, if the Holy Spirit's not living in you, then you're just a flesh person and everything you do is negative. Yeah. Amen. So the whole idea that you take the caveman and you domesticate him and send him to college and he comes out a good citizen and a good person and he's a valuable part of the community and he wins the lawn of the month award in his community. That's all BS. Yeah. Everything the wicked man does, everything a person who's not born again does, it's a sin. Yeah. Everybody say it's a sin. It's a sin. Yeah, but what if he's trying really hard? It's a, it's a sin. Well, what if he did it with good intentions? It's a sin. What if he was really mean? It's still a sin. And a lot of people feel better by looking at others and saying, well, I know a guy and he dropped six banks and, and he shot four people and all, and I'm a lot better than him. Yeah. But the reality is, even the plowing, and you're talking to a group where when that was spoken, most people were farmers. Yeah. When you get your oxen, you go out there and hook them up, you start plowing your field, God looks down, more sin. More sin. Everybody say it with me, more sin. So what can a sinner do in life? Just sin. Can't do anything else. So, in case you think I might be dreaming up some of this stuff, we're going to look at the scripture. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. That's right. Yes. So, am I always right? No. I'm right most of the time. Not a good idea to have an argument with me because all the things I think and say have been prayed over for years Amen. and said it in the scripture and I come out right most of the time. And when my wife and I ever have a disagreement, God forbid, mm. she can tell you 90% of the time I'm right. <laughs> but I'm not always right. And I don't always have the correct motives. And I don't always do the right thing. I try to. 
But sometimes we miss the mark. You know, the basic word for sin is yeah. miss the mark. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So for a Christian, you're trying to do the right thing. You've got your arrow focused on the target, going to hit the bullseye, and go, whoops, boom. You didn't hit the bullseye. You didn't even hit the target. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Missing the mark. Yeah. But the fundamental thing that we need to understand is that when Christ shows up and we pray, oh God, invade our service. Come Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come on Jesus, you're welcome here. Come on Lord. Well the Bible says whenever he shows up, his reward is with him. Yes. Isaiah 40 verse 10 says Yahweh is coming and his reward is with him. The book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 12, the Apostle John says, quoting yes. Christ as saying, Behold, I come quickly, yes. and my reward is with me. Yes. Yes. Whenever the Holy Spirit shows up, when it's in a service, or at your home, or on your job, whenever the Holy Spirit shows up and you sense the presence of God, He comes with rewards. Yeah. Yeah. So you and I are working on what kind of a program? If we're born again, only program we have is a rewards program. Right. We don't have a penalty program. We don't have a punishment program. You say, well, God's not going to like it if you misbehave. No, he's not. And he'll say, hey, psst, no. psst. hey, you, you, a naughty boy, you naughty donkey man, a naughty boy, dummy, I'm talking to you. You go, God, what, what is it? You're going the wrong way. Yeah. Now, lest we think that we can play with God since our our credit can't get ruined and all we can do is get rewards. Right. Yeah. How many of you like a program where all you can get is a reward? Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, if you get out of line long enough, you come to a point where God says, okay, I'm through talking to you. Yeah. I've gone to half a dozen ministers and God only sent me to people I didn't know and didn't know their situation. And I went in and told them, God sent me with a message for you. And you're, what? Who are you? Well, I'm nobody. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. Yeah. But I'll tell you what he said. He said, he's tired of you messing up. And this is your last chance. Mm. What? Okay, I'll repeat it in case you were hard of hearing. I'm tired of you messing up. Get back on track. You know what I called you to do. You know what you're supposed to be doing. Now get with the program. Yeah. And they go, oh, really? And I said, you want the second half of the message? Yeah, what's that? Or else. Oh, Lord. See, or else what? I said, that's between you and him. I'm just telling you, no more slack. No more get out of jail free card. Mm. You say, well, when you sin, doesn't God just get mad? No, he doesn't get mad. He gets mad at you when you disobey so many times yeah. that he's tired of fooling with you. Yeah. He's invested yeah. money and time and love and angel power and yeah. things and he's trying to help you. Yeah. And he gets tired when we go too far and then he yanks us in and delivers us to the other side. He's like, what do you mean? Well, one of those two, well, I was thinking of two specific men, but there were half a dozen of them. One of them, I preached his funeral about three years later. Mm. Wow. Didn't know him, but we developed a relationship. God sent me to him. He kept doing cocaine and had a 17-year-old girlfriend or whatever, and God just, <laughs> perfect health. Just took him. Heart attack. He's gone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hard to preach a sermon for a person who was a minister who fell into the pit and never would climb out. Now, God will give you slack. He lived three more years after I went to see him. I preached at the church numerous times. But I'm telling you, we've got to get a hold on the program. God has a program. It's not just all fun and games and happy, although I have a lot of fun. I don't play many games, but I am happy. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit for all of us. Yes. Somebody say, I'm happy. I'm happy. If you're
you're not happy, then you're not with God's program the way he wants you to be because he wants all of us to be happy. Amen. That's why he doesn't have a report card with a negative side on it. Yes. Amen. When I go before God, and incidentally, most people say, well, God doesn't say anything. He quit speaking when he wrote the Bible, and he said, I'm done. I don't have anything else to say. Now, that's nothing like that in the Bible. The scripture says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Well, why would you come boldly before the throne of grace if God can't talk? Yeah. You rush into his presence. God, I'm here. I'm in this situation. I got this and I got that. God, you know, give me some clues here. What should I be doing? <laughs> the idea that God quit talking only a, a moron would come up with such an idea. <laughs> God can't quit talking. He's the Word. Amen. The Word can't quit being the Word. And the Word can't quit being spoken. But the Word of God in the Scripture is the same as the Word of God that you and I breathe when the anointing is upon us. We're breathing out the Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want to make this clear, and that's why I'm going to pound on a few of these principles until I believe that we're all getting it. I already quoted yeah. uh, Isaiah 40.10, Revelation 22.12, Romans 12.19, a scripture. I'm not, I'll am not. i tell you to turn to some scriptures in a minute, but Romans 12.19 says... Paul said, and he's quoting an Old Testament scripture, he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Yahweh. Yeah. Amen. So every time God comes, he does something for you. Yes. Mm. When the anointing shows up, you get a blessing. Yes. You see, I could go to a service where the pastor or whoever was speaking was almost brain dead, but if there's anointing in the service, I get my blessing and go on home. Because when the Holy Spirit shows up, the blessings just flowing like crazy. Mm -hmm. Like a river of life flowing into the people. Mm -hmm. Somebody say, I get mine. Mm -hmm. Making a difference to everybody else gets theirs, I get mine. Mm -hmm. You say, well, what if I've seen pastors that get up and preach and they have tight shirts and big muscles. And they stand around like they're a model, you know. And they pose all the time. And you're going, what are you doing? Are you making a fool of yourself yeah. on TV? Wake up, man. That's the world's BS. That's not the kingdom of God. Oh, hallelujah. Vengeance is mine. But see, the world would have you think it stops there. Oh, no. That's just the quick and easy part. And vengeance is mine says you don't have to punish anybody. Your neighbor shoots your cat. You don't have to go punch him in the face. Somebody's mean to you, rude to you, disrespects you. You don't have to pull them over and thrash them good. Because God says vengeance is mine. If it's his, then it's not ours. Yeah. I don't need to take revenge on anybody. I don't have to pray against people. So haven't you ever prayed against anyone? But I have, but only when they won't stop pestering me. And then I don't put some big curse on them. I just say, God, all that negative energy and all the bad things they're saying about me, multiply it by ten and send it back to their house. Amen. Well, if they didn't say anything bad, then ten times multiplied zero would be zero. But if they're into mischief, now they're in trouble. But I didn't curse them. I just sent them their own package. Send, return to sender. And the address is known. Hallelujah. And so just for those who will see the tape later, Romans 12, 19, I will repay, says Yahweh. That's also found in Leviticus 19, 18 and Deuteronomy 32, 35. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I want to give you another scripture and then we're going to get into the word a little bit. Amen. Genesis 15, 1. Mm -hmm. Yahweh is saying to Abraham, yes. I'm your shield and your exceeding, exceeding. unbelievably great Amen. reward. Yes. Yes. Well, Abraham was rich. He had a couple of thousand people in his group. He was the big prophet of the group. <laughs> He ruled over them like a king, a monarch. 
total control. See, we've got to look at the way historically the people were living back then. When David decided he wanted Bathsheba, kings in those days, they took any woman they wanted. No one, no one would even go, wait, you can't do that. Yeah. You could do anything you wanted. If he didn't like your looks, he'd just point to you and tell one of the executioners, see that, see yeah. the guy? I don't like his looks. Mm -hmm. And they just pull you out there and cut your head off. Mm -hmm. And so these guys ruled with an iron hand and they killed people every day. Yeah. They promoted people and demoted people just like they were God. Yeah. So we look at David and say, oh, he was a terrible man, a sinner and all that. But in his eyes and in the eyes of the people, they understood that the king had total rule. He ruled just like God. He could have anybody's wife, anybody's daughter, anybody's land. Remember when Ahab wanted the land yeah. of Naboth's vineyard? Mm -hmm. Well, the king can take any land he wants to take. That's the way they operated. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we've got to understand a little bit about the thinking of people in those days. Yes. Amen. But God told Abraham, I'm your exceeding great reward. Well, what's the context of all that? Well, the previous chapter, he just got done. Abraham was functioning as a prophet and a king. In the previous chapter, Abraham had just been in this big battle, and out comes a guy named Melchizedek and ordained him into the Melchizedek priesthood. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa! I thought only Jesus was in a Melchizedek priesthood, and there's only one person. Well, how about if Melchizedek was in the Melchizedek priesthood? That's where it came from. Yeah. Everybody say it originated. it originated. And he ordained Abraham into it. And guess what else? Mm. Every king of Israel, when they were ordained, yeah. the priests laid hands on them and said, we're ordaining you into the Melchizedek priesthood. Mm. Every king yes. of Israel was always ordained with that yes. wording. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have been raised with so many misconceptions. I'm trying to clear up a few of those today. Amen. But here's Abraham. He just got ordained and felt this big anointing. And he was so excited. He never met Melchizedek before. And he gave him, they just had this big battle. He had wagons full of gold and silver yeah. and fancy clothes and servants and horses and all this stuff. And he gave 10% of all that to Melchizedek. Yes. Okay. So while it, well, Melchizedek wasn't a real person, mm. and that's what the current theologians tell you, yeah. it's just a, 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 a appearing of Jesus. Yeah. Well, if he wasn't a real person, he, he was king of Jerusalem. Yeah. Amen. You see, well, it says he was king of Salem. Yeah, it was Jerusalem. Yeah. <laughs> if he wasn't a real king, how did he take horses, mm. gold and silver and yeah. wagons and slaves? And take them all back home. Yeah. Okay. So we got to let some of the cobwebs get blown out of our mind. Shh. Blow away some of the cobwebs like a, the fog on the river early in the morning. And you can't see very well. There's just fog. Shh. Let the Holy Spirit blow yeah. all that stuff. Shh. Yeah. Blow that out of your mind yeah. so you can see clearly that yeah. God has a program. And it's not complicated. It's simple. If we get beyond the lies and foolishness that we've been told all our lives and the crazy stuff we see on TV and here on the radio, Abraham had just got that. And so God says, Abraham, the, the best thing I'm going to give you is more of my presence. Wow. Amen. And this is a great, great, exceeding great reward. Lord. Yeah. Now, what did Abraham say? He was a normal person. He said, well... Can I get anything else? Now that's what our carnal mind thinks, isn't it? If you say, well, God's going to be with you and hold your hand. Jesus is going to walk through life with you holding your hand. And you'll always feel his comforting presence. And our thought in the back of our mind is, well, what about a good house? Can I get a good house? Well, what about a riding mower instead of a push mower? Yeah. And we start thinking of things, right? Because we're human. And so 
Abraham immediately is thinking, well, what else can I get? And God says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make your descendants as numberless as the stars of heaven and as numberless as the sand of the sea. Amen. And Abraham said, well, now we're getting somewhere. Amen. Hallelujah. The truth is, from God's perspective, His presence and His anointing being with you is a given. Yeah. You don't have to say, God, please be with me today. He's with you. Yes, He is. God, watch over me today. And yes. Keep me out of mischief. He will. He's right there. Yeah. God, I need you to come along with me. I'm going to. The boss is mad. I could be fired. Come with me, Jesus, into that meeting. I'm going to. He will, he's with you. Yes. You don't even have to pray. He's right there with you. Amen. 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 Okay. So this stuff just gets better and better and better. I'm so excited I can hardly <laughs> act right. You know, you're supposed to be presentable and nice. Yeah. Went to church the other day in this the big church and this pastor he preached two thirds of his message with both hands like this both hands behind his back you know what he was saying I'm helpless I'm harmless don't hurt me don't let the board get me don't let the deacons get me don't let the women's missionary union get me don't let them all get me God I'm so helpless don't hurt me I won't hurt a fly I'm just a, a weak little sissy pie up here Oh, told my wife when we left, I said, I've never been so disgusted in my whole life. I'm supposed to get up and preach with power and demonstration of the Spirit yeah. and the revelation of God coming forth, and instead you're telling people, I'm weak, I'm a sissy, you don't hurt me. <laughs> and we dare call that religion? Oh, I think not. Mm. Well, lest someone think... I've made all that up. Let's hit a couple of scriptures with me, okay? You ready? Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew chapter 5. You're going to like it. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading in verse 11. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when men revile. Revile means they criticize to the point where they're angry, foaming at the mouth, mad dog, just disgusted, and then disgust. I hate you. Mm. Blessed are you when people treat you that way, and when they persecute you, and when they say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Now the blessing has to come when you didn't do it. If they call you a bank robber and you Amen. just robbed a bank, I'm sorry. Yeah. It happened. Amen. When they do this falsely, he says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward. Where? Amen. On the other side. Amen. In heaven. Amen. Is that clear enough? Amen. Now, if some are going to get a great reward, and others are assumedly going to get a small reward, then everybody gets something different in heaven. Yeah. Amen. Right? Amen. Degrees of reward in heaven by rank, authority. Don't you remember the story where Jesus said to those who were faithful, some were given uh, authority over ten cities and some were given authority over a hundred cities. Yeah. That's rewards. Yeah. Okay? So, great reward comes when you stand in the face of persecution. And I'll just tell you in advance, there's two things that get <laughs> overwhelming, stupendously great, unbelievable woo, rewards. Yes. Standing in the face of persecution is one. And obedience to the instructions God gives you. I didn't say obeying the Bible. I said obedience to the instruction He gives yeah, you. That's right. Yeah. You see, everybody wants to hear from God. <laughs> Somebody give me a word. I had a guy call me in the last week. Say, I'm getting ready to make a big decision. Can you tell me what God wants me to do? I gave him two or three hints, but I didn't tell him what God wants me to do. You know why? If God gives you a direct instruction and you disobey it, he gets very upset. Mm -hmm. I told you. 
not to do that. Or I told you to do that, you refuse to do it. Don't you know that Jonah didn't just get up one morning and say, Oh, that's a pretty day. I think I'll go for a whale ride. I think I'll go to Nineveh and preach to the city. Oh, no, maybe I won't. He didn't get up like that. God told him, go to Nineveh. Yeah. Amen. What happened when he disobeyed went the opposite direction? God prepared. He prepared. A fish didn't happen along. A great white shark didn't come by. Yeah. God prepared a special fish. That's right. That swallowed him and took him deep down into the ocean. Amen. You know what happened to him there? He died. And when he was in the gates of hell, he lifted up his eyes and said, God, I think I made a mistake. I think I'm going in the wrong direction. Can we back up and reverse this? Can we rectify this situation? Can we straighten this out, God? Can we work this out between us? And God said, are, are we talking, work it out like go to Nineveh and preach? Oh, yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm excited, God. Let me go to Nineveh and preach. It's okay. Whale comes up, spits him on the dry land. Yeah. He's alive. Amen. Somebody say, I'm alive. I'm alive. You're alive by the grace of God. Amen. 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 So, great can be your reward in heaven. Look at Matthew chapter 6. We're going to hit a couple scriptures on Matthew and then we're jumping to Hebrews. Matthew chapter 6. Begin reading in verse 19. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Yeah. That doesn't mean you can't have a savings account. But we need to be understanding where the emphasis and the important things in life are. Because if you lay up a treasure on earth, moth and rust can destroy, thieves can break in and steal, and I hate to, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but human governments and human societies and human banks can fail. Amen. The little city we lived in, Wallace, in 15 years, the bank went bankrupt four times. It got bought out. What does that mean? It means... They were underwater. They owed more money than they had reserves in the bank. Mm -hmm. So they sell the bank. And theoretically, the bank is worth, you know, $2 million. And they sell it for a million because they know they're upside down and they're all messed up. Well, in Greece, their economy failed. And guess what the government did? Yeah. They took everybody's money out yeah. of the bank. The government took it all. You say, well, that could never happen here. Exactly, and it could never happen in Greece either. Lord. <laughs> Unfortunately, it just did. Yeah. Amen. The government does whatever it has to to survive. Yeah. And if that means taking your money, yeah. I'm not even going to go into all that stuff. You folks should know that by now. We're all adults here. We know... We don't, you know, jump and dance for trinkets and beads. Amen. That's right. We look clear-eyed into the reality of what exactly is going on. Yes. Yeah. Amen. And that's what I'm trying to help us all do this morning. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. And I'm not immune. If I misbehave, you think God says, no problem, I don't mind. No. You see, you've got to understand God's perspective. God doesn't care if you smoke a cigarette or fell and broke your leg. He doesn't care about any of that kind of foolishness. He's interested in his kingdom and your heart being for Christ. Yeah. And all the things we're worried about, he's not concerned about all that. Mm -hmm. You say, well, why all those rules? And why the Ten Commandments? Because the people of God have been in bondage for 435 years in Egypt and they learn how to be murderous and adulterous and lying and thieving and stealing and... Yeah. And angry and violent people. They were like a bunch of angry mad dogs. And they were only controlled by swords and spears and whips. That's right. And they went out in the wilderness and guess what? They were the same people that right. they were last week. That's right. Yeah. And so Moses said, these people are wild and crazy and out of control. See, he'd been gone for 80 years. He said, these people are wild and crazy and out of control. He said, well, we're going to give you some rules to tighten them up. 
get their conduct back into something reasonable because they're totally mad dog out of control, bumming at the mouth, crazy people. Yeah. That's right. And we want them to be worshipers of God instead. So he gave them those rules and they've forgotten the name of Yahweh. They were no longer worshiping. They didn't no longer call God Yahweh. They spoke of all the gods of the Babylonians, yeah. the Egyptians. Amen. 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 So he gave all those rules as a temporary set of instructions to explain what is going to get you into trouble. Yeah. You say, well, now if God doesn't care about all the things we're worried about all the time, what exactly, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves you with this. God gives you instructions that he wants you to follow. Yeah. God loves you and he wants to love you into cooperation. God loves you and wants you to have a good and a happy and a peaceful life. God loves you and he's not going to put anything negative on your account no matter what you do. Doesn't mean you won't do anything negative, but it means it's not going on your account. As far as he's concerned, there's no sin on your account. If there's sin in your account, then you'd have to go to hell, but you can't go to hell because the Holy Spirit's on the inside. And since the Holy Spirit's on the inside, there's no sin on your account. Mm. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. Yes. Amen. So here you are, sinless, spotless, washed. Everybody say, I'm clean. I'm clean. Somebody said, well, you don't know what Freddie did last night. That doesn't make any difference what Freddie did last night. Yeah. If Freddie was misbehaving last night, God's going to say, Freddie, Freddie, hey, Fred, I'm talking to you, Fred, going in the wrong direction. Hello, going in the wrong direction. One time my wife and I were driving, I had the big new Buick, and I was flying down the road probably exceeding the speed limit, <laughs> but God didn't care. <laughs> speed limit is there so that we don't kill each yeah. other when we're driving. Exactly. God, why would God care what the speed limit is? Yeah. Why would God care whether they made marijuana legal or illegal or whiskey legal or illegal or you live in a dry county in a wet county? God's not interested in all that. He's trying, he gives us rules to help us not to hurt each other. That's yeah. right, amen. Well, why shouldn't I commit adultery? Because it hurts your family and your That's spouse right. and those around you. Amen. Well, why shouldn't I steal from my neighbor? Because he worked hard for that stuff. Yeah. And he's got a difficult enough life without you taking his stuff when he's not looking. That's right. yeah. And the things that get us in trouble are the things that we do intentionally to hurt other people. Uh -huh. God does care when we hurt one another. Yeah. Yes, amen. Right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't care about all the weird things that we get caught up in because none of that makes a hill of beans to God. What he's interested in is you living at peace with your neighbor and loving your family and loving your pastor, loving your church, Amen. standing up for your country, trying to do what's right. Amen. Amen. Okay? Yeah. So you're saying he doesn't care what we do. I'm not saying that. Don't misunderstand. Paul said that because of the grace he was preaching, that people thought he was saying, send all you want. Yeah. God will just forgive you. Yeah, that's that's right. Paul said, God forbid. Yeah. That's not what I said. Amen. Amen. Everybody say he was misquoted. <laughs> he was misquoted. Yeah. So I don't want to be misquoted. Yeah. I'm not telling you to live any way you want because there is a penalty attached. That's right. Amen. You can rob a bank if you want to. Well, what are you going to do with the FBI? Yeah. That's right. Come on. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah, I counseled a minister who robbed several banks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And he died. Yeah. <clears throat> Spent all night. He gave me his New Testament. He had six kids. And he was born across the Mexican border out in California. And he went over there two or three times a month. And so and he was broke and Faithful in church and all, and somebody said, Look, I got a little package, and if you just put it in your suitcase, we give you five grand to walk it across the border. Well, they saw him coming all, he knew the guards of where he crossed by name and everything, and they knew as a preacher, walked the stuff across there. It was drugs. Wow. And so, a couple months later, he said, You guys need me to walk anything else across? For about 10 grand, they said, sure. Amen. 
Well, the next thing you know, he's living in a big house, bought himself a Mercedes, got money to burn, and they said, how'd you like to go on a bank robbery? He said, oh, no, 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 I'm not going on any bank robberies because somebody could get hurt. Well, anyway, he was the getaway driver and he drove for several bank robberies and now he had satchels full of money, you know, little briefcases full of money and those little gym bags where you got put your bowling ball or your gym shoes in. He had bags and packages full of money all over the house. Wow. Yeah. Still preaching, he was one of the elders, but he was ordained and he preached a lot. He was a really good guy and his wife's sweet and we'd known them for many years and they had is it six or eight children dear I can't remember eight a whole household it looked like the steps going up the stairs and they're all living for Jesus today but old dad got into mischief you say well the preacher couldn't do that if he's born again sure he could there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man yeah. but God will let with every temptation make a way of escape yes he didn't have to go to rob a bank. No. Mm -hmm. That's right. So he was up all night. He said, I messed up, Dr. McKinney, because these guys told me if I don't do another robbery with them this week, they're going to kill me and all my family. So I just think I'm going to have to go to the FBI and turn myself in. I said, well, what do you think? You're going to go down there and rat out this gang of people, and they're going to let you live? Is that what you think? I talked to him all night. We had breakfast together. He gave me his New Testament. And I said, well, what's your decision? I told him all night, come home with me. I'll feed you and your family for six or eight months or a year. And you can get yourself back on track, get things worked out between you and God from the rebellion you've been in. And you can have your life straightened out. I would tell you his name, but his name is not, does not matter. But by the grace of God, it could be me. It could be you. Yeah. Amen. You never know what you do until you don't have anything to eat and you got eight kids at home. That's right. It's rough. Nobody said this was going to be a picnic. No. I enjoy myself most of the time as if I was on a picnic. But some people would say that's kind of delusional. Mm. Amen. Amen. So he went on and did another robbery. That was like in September. And God told me on New Year's morning, he said, you're going to see death today. Mm. I said, dear, the Holy Spirit. we were driving across North Texas and Oklahoma and going somewhere to preach. And I said, dear, the Holy Spirit just told me I was going to see death today. She said, well, you better drive careful. Mm. So we didn't know if we were going to see an accident or what we were going to have. Phone rings. Hey, what's up? Friend of ours for 30 years. What's up, honey? How you doing? Uh, he's dead. I said, oh, I'm sorry. What in the world happened? Well, they went out to do a bank robbery and somebody had tipped off the FBI and the FBI was there and he got shot and died in the robbery. So let me tell you what. When God comes to visit you, he only brings rewards. Everybody says that's all. That's all. Don't bring anything else. But if you're misbehaving, Lord. When he shows up, he also whispers in your ear, you need to get it together. Yeah. You're going the wrong way. This is not good. I want to help you here, but you're not going the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And ultimately, what he will do, if you resist to go the wrong way enough, and he warns you enough what he will do whoop he just takes you out of the picture i told you last night about william Branham, the greatest prophet of the last century yeah. as far as we know he was 10 or 15 years younger than me at the height of his popularity doing stadium meetings with tens of thousands of people and crazy people being healed 
hundred at a time all over the place, crazy wheelchairs being knocked over and people running all over the building. Craziest stuff you ever see. It makes the crusades you see on TV look yeah. like child's play. Yeah. This guy was the real deal. And I'm not saying, I mean, Benny Hinn is a very normal person and he is the real deal. He just not in the same category as this guy. Yeah. Same thing with Oral Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman and all these people. Just not in the same category. Well, what happened to him at the height of his ministry? That's right. 1965. Yeah. He pulled up to a stop sign out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Bam! And he was hit with another vehicle. Exploded his vehicle exploded into flames and he was gone in a second. Boom! Yes. Everybody said he's gone. He's gone. Well, why would God do that? Uh, I told you, and you're not listening, mm. hello, I'm giving you another chance, get with the program, you know what you're supposed to be doing, you haven't been praying, you haven't been saying, you haven't been preaching, you haven't, you haven't been doing any of this stuff, I told you, get, mm. get in with the program now, there's nobody so high and mighty yeah. that God is impressed, oh, Lord. and he loves to give instructions, we say, Oh, help me find the will of God. I'm sorry. It's not your job to find the will of God. It's God's job to let you know yes. what he wants you to do. Yes. So, well, what, if, what if I don't know what to do? Well, then just stay, stay put, tread water, and do what you're well, supposed to be yeah. doing until he yeah. gives you some instruction. Right. He's not going to judge you because, well, you didn't have enough discernment to figure it out. <laughs> we got you. God doesn't do any gotcha. Mm -hmm. It's not your job to find the will of God. It's not my job to explain it to you. Mm -hmm. God will let you know when it's time to move and change and yeah. grow and develop yeah. and adjust your attitude. Yeah. See, well, don't you like to think of yourself as an attitude adjuster? I do, but it's because I'm speaking the word of God and the word of God adjusts all of our attitudes. Yeah. Amen. Let God be true and everybody else, sorry, yeah. Charlie. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, it's like when they arrested Paul and some of the apostles in the New Testament. <coughs> and they brought them in and made accusations and said, Now, are you going to obey us or not? Yeah. Just tell us. He said, Well, should we obey you or should we obey God? And then they're in a pickle because who wants to say, don't obey God? Because <laughs> yeah. these are very religious people, Amen. right? Amen. Amen. Is anybody getting anything out of this? I hope so. I hope so. I want to say a word before I go to Hebrews. Oh, look, it's early. I want to say a word before I go to Hebrews about Jezebel. Jezebel. Jezebel was a wicked queen over Israel. And her husband's name was what? Ahab. Both of these were high priests to pagan cults. All pagan cults worshipped sex, yeah. Money, power. Mm -hmm. Preferably the sex part. Yeah. All the pagan cults had their temples were just a house of prostitution. Yeah. And you got to take drugs and pay for prostitutes of any age, of any sex, of any kind you wanted. And it's a lot worse than that. That's making it sound good. Oh. This was some depraved stuff you couldn't even imagine. You know, Alexander Crowley and people that worship Satan all the time would be embarrassed to go to some of those services. Like, whoa, this is too crazy. And everybody went, grandma and grandpa, all the little kids, everybody went because it was worshiping their God. Yeah. So here we have a wicked king and a wicked queen, and the Bible says that there never had been a king as wicked as Ahab. He was the worst that ever happened to Israel. Everybody say the worst. worst. Couldn't get any worse. Right? So you remember the story. They were all mad at Elijah. Yeah. King saw him and said, there's the trouble of Israel. Elijah said, oh no, I'm not the trouble of Israel. You're the trouble of Israel. You're the troublemaker. Yeah. 
So, the Bible says, King, the king had 400 yeah. priests of Baal on his team. Jezebel had 450. How many, you're, you're all mathematicians, how many does that make? Yeah. 850, right? You got the math? Amen. Well, you know when he went up on the, he challenged the prophets of Baal and they went up on Mount Carmel? Everybody know the story? Well, how many prophets died? So they cut their heads off and piled them up and yeah. made a memorial out of the skulls of all the false prophets. Amen. Now, can you imagine 850 demon-possessed, wow. sex-crazed, perverted, violent, you know, the kind of people that cut somebody's head off and spurt it and drink the blood out just for fun and say, boy, wasn't that fun? Mm -hmm. Let's kill one of the kids next, you know? These kind of people, 850 of them, living at the king's palace. Wow. And they're running the kingdom of God from their this situation. God said, no, 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 honey, that's not going to happen. Do you ever wonder why when they killed the prophets, there were only 450 of them died? Because mm. Jezebel was pure wicked. 450 of them were her people. Man. Ahab was a complete idiot, but he was smart enough to know, don't go up on that mountain fool with Elijah. Somebody could get killed up there. He told all his guys, you, you boys stay at home. Yeah. Stay yeah. at home. Somebody's going to get killed up on that mountain showing up. And so that's why they cut their heads off and only 450 of them had to die. Well, what do you do with the people that are that wicked, that are in a place of authority? You can't even conceive of anybody being that wicked. And they're the high priestesses and stuff of their cult. And so here's what God did, the final grand finale. That was just the prelude to the, to the big finish. Amen. Cutting off the heads. Yeah. And so here's Jezebel. Her 450 prophets are all dead. Their heads are in a big pile, like a little pyramid of skulls. Wow. And she's thinking, well, at least I'm alive. <laughs> at least I'm doing okay. <laughs> at least I'm still the queen of Israel. <laughs> God anointed a new sheriff in town. Amen. Jehu came rolling in with his guards. And the Bible says Jezebel had painted her face and put all the decorations of gold in her hair. And she came to the window, probably a balcony type window, and greets them all as they come in, you know. And here's King Jehu, the new sheriff in town. And he said, is anybody up there for Yahweh? Mm. And three eunuchs. A eunuch is the slave they captured and they castrate him. So they're safe, hopefully, around yeah. the women and children. But they were servants, and they were serving her. They said, is anybody up there for Yahweh? And those three eunuchs waved out the window. We are. Said, throw her off the balcony. <laughs> yeah. She threw off the balcony, and blood splattered all up on the wall of the building. King Jehu and his horses came over. And they just trampled her into a bloody pulp with the horse feet. Yeah. Just stomping and trampling and killing and stomping and stomping and stomping. And then they rode off and the dogs came in. And the only thing that was left of Jezebel for them to put in the coffin or whatever kind of ceremony they were doing, the only thing left, the Bible said, was her skull. Not her head because all the meat had been gone. Everything was chewed up and eaten by the dogs. The skull... In her hands. Mm. Yeah. Say, well, does God just let wickedness go on forever? No, 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 don't think that. That's, that's not right. Yeah. Because God does not bring judgment up, upon problems quickly, then we think, well, he either hasn't noticed or he doesn't really care. Yeah. Well, it's not true. He has noticed. He does care. Yes. Yeah.
Everybody say it with me. He has noticed. He does care. And so payday, someday, God came and rendered unto wicked Jezebel the just rewards of her and her bones laid out in the street and the dogs were fighting over her, pulling on her bones and eating her feet and all that kind of stuff. And she was the queen. And the gold and the fancy stuff she had on, the dogs ate it. It became dog food. Yeah. Amen. You see, in the right situation, when God moves in a situation, the gold and silver and that precious thing that we treasure, you know, some of us got a little safe at home with three or four things that we really like, just becomes dog food. Mm. Wow. Hallelujah. Wow. All right, I'm going to move on from Jezebel. So I say, thank God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Okay, here we are, rushing right along. Yes. We already got to Matthew, right? We covered yes. Matthew. Oh, we didn't We didn't go to Matthew 6, did we? We did 5. Do we do 6, lay up your treasure in heaven? Yes. Okay. Let me say this about laying up your treasure in heaven. Your treasure is all the things you do prompted by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You say, well, is it, don't I get a reward for just being a Christian and being filled with the Holy Spirit? No, oh, maybe just a, you know, a little reward. But the big rewards come from obedience and standing in the time of persecution. Yeah. I want to go over to Hebrews, and we're going to wrap this up in just about two seconds. Mm, maybe. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Hebrews. The book of yes, Hebrews, Lord. chapter 6. You're going to enjoy this. Yes. Hebrews yeah. chapter 6. I'm reading somewhere in Hebrews. How about chapter... Where am I? I've got chapter 11. But I had something I thought in Hebrews chapter 6. Well, maybe I need to skip. So I can't cover everything in the Bible today. Yeah. But I do want you to get... A little bit of blessing along the way. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll skip a scripture. Say, thank you, God. Be merciful. <laughs> Hebrews chapter. You know, I'd rather preach than eat ice cream and oh, Lord. fajitas. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Help us. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. Let's start at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Yeah. Well, obviously, to get born again, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Yes. You say, God, I believe you exist, and I believe in Jesus, and I, I believe that he died for my sins. And so, without faith, it is impossible to please God in any way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the person who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists in his invisible world, all right, do you believe that? He's up there. He's in his invisible world. No doubt he's there, but that's not enough. Yeah. You have to believe yes. that he is a what? Rewarder. Rewarder. Amen. You say, well, God is love. Okay, he is love, but he's also a rewarder. Yeah. I mean, he's also righteousness and peace and joy. He's a lot of things. Amen. But in terms of the mechanical... How's it working and what are we doing? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 And so if you understand God at all, then you know that He's a rewarder. Now, what is the difference if He's a rewarder if everybody went to heaven and got the same reward? Yeah. That would be meaningless. Yeah. Right? Exactly. You don't all get the same reward. Some get rulership over nothing. Mm -hmm. Some get rulership over five cities or ten cities or fifty cities or a hundred cities. There's responsibility and function, yeah. and relationship and obedience and worship. There's all these things in that invisible spiritual world right. that God operates and he always operates on a pattern of, everybody say, rewards. 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 Yes. You know that 
he who find us a, a wife find us a good thing and he's found a reward from the Lord. Yeah. Did you know that having quivers in your little thing for your arrow, you know, the quivers, the arrows in your quiver are a reward from Yahweh. Amen. So don't decide to have one baby and stop. Please, Jesus, don't do that. God never intended for anybody to have one baby and stop. Help me, Lord. Don't obey the world system. Have all the kids you want. They don't cost that much money. So yes, they do. Well, they only do if you follow the world pattern. If you don't follow the world pattern, we never bought a baby bed. We took an armchair with arms on it and put that thing right up next to the bed. And there's where the baby slept. And my wife, had to, uh, 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 she just reached right over and hook it up so it could nurse in the middle of the night. Didn't even wake me up. As opposed to, and she's got to get up and tend to the baby and go in there and warm a bottle and go over here and do that and go over here and check the diaper. We worry ourselves to death, fool of the world system. That system is for losers. Yes. God's system is smooth and easy. He said, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Amen. 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 Got to diligently seek him. And then what does he do? He rewards the crap out of you. Yes. Woo! Yes. Now, I right. love this. Let's turn over to Hebrews 11, 35. You're going to like this. Yes. Hebrews 11, 35. Don't let it hide from you. It's right there. Mm. Let me back up to verse 32 just so you'll get a, a feeling for what the writer of Hebrews is discussing. So he's discussed all these heroes of the faith, Abraham and David and, you know, all these heroes. Amen. So now he says in verse 32, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, you know, Gideon hid behind the yeah. shed and he became, you know, the light in the thing and break it and blow the trumpet yes. in great deliverance. Amen. He said, Samson, we all know about Samson, Delilah. Jephthah, also David, and Samuel, and the prophets. He says in verse 33, Through faith they subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. That's the Hebrew boys. Yeah. And this one guy told me when he was a little, he's a black pastor, he said, I always thought it was Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. He said, I, I didn't understand why the one guy was a bad Negro. It's a bad Negro. He says in verse 34, they quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. They became valiant in battle. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Woo! What a list of miracles and deliverances and rewards and wow. wonderful blessings. Incredible stuff. Amen. Wow. Everybody said, wow. 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 Now it gets serious. Yes. Wow. Now it says two little words. Mm. We're switching gears. He said, but others. Yeah. Everybody say others. 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 Uh, everybody say others. 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 others were tortured. Uh-oh. Anybody ever want to be tortured? No. Not me. If my wife says, I'm going to tie you to the bed and get the whip out, I'll say, hold up. <laughs> That's a joke. I have just checking your sense of humor. Yeah. Others were tortured, not accepting yes. deliverance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. So that they might obtain yes. a better resurrection. Yes. In other words, that they might have increased and multiplied rewards yeah. on the other side. Yeah. Right. Yes. Now, if you have a bank account spiritually, lay not up for yourself treasures on earth, moth the rust, break through, thieves will steal it. 
Lay up treasure in heaven. What are the treasures we're laying up in heaven? Acts of obedience. Yes. Acts of love. Acts of blessing. I went to a church once and there was a guy in the church that ran a detail business. He said, I was driving a Mercedes at the time. He said, let me detail your Mercedes tomorrow afternoon before the service. I said, okay. He said, I'll come by the motel and pick it up. I said, okay. Man, he worked on that thing. It looked better than a brand new car. I was amazed at what he did. I said, man, how much do you charge for a detailed job like that? He said, wait a bit. He said, I spent all day on it. Mm. I said, well, how much do you want? He said, Jesus paid it all. Yes. Amen. He did an act of service out of love. And I believe the Holy Spirit encouraged him to do that out of love and obedience. Amen. So he's got building up treasures. He's doing things. He's obeying the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's working with God. He's working with others. He's loving his family. He's doing all the things he could possibly do. And it's not that we're trying to make God happy. God's already happy. That's right. But he set up a system. How many of you know when you throw a bucket of rocks in the air, yeah. you're going to get beaten the head with rocks. Yeah. He set up a system where when you're mischievous, you're going to suffer. Yeah. When you walk with God and you're righteous, you're going to have rewards. Amen. Right. Now, the Bible says, you correct me if I'm wrong, it says they could have been yeah. delivered. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, how do you get delivered when you're in these terrible situations? You call on your heavenly bank account. I need to make a withdrawal. Yeah. It's mine. I have blessings, uh, turnarounds, uh, incredible things in my account. Yeah. I can pull them out and get a deliverance. I can get any kind of miracle. I can get whatever I need to help me because I have the, the money, the stuff, the blessings in my account. I can pull some out here on earth or I can suffer and wait to get my reward on the other side Amen. or some portion of it. That's right. They chose to suffer now and not make the withdrawal. See, well, if I had the, the wherewithal to make a withdrawal, I'd get me some fancy duds in a big house and, and, you know, I'd be on TV telling jokes and stuff. I'd just be wild and crazy and rock and rolling, you know, with the big time. Well, you can get rewards now. Yeah. Or you can get rewards later because yeah. they're your rewards. Yeah. Now, I told God a long time ago, and the truth is I don't have any money. I've never owned a house. I never gave him a hootootie about the whole thing. Never owned a house. Never had any significant amount of money. I make about 15 grand a year. Say well, you share up here to make a lot more than I do. Make a whole lot more than that. Well, how does that work? Well, people just keep blessing me. Giving me things. Giving me cars. Letting my kids go to school free. My daughter, Jessica, got $30,000 worth. Eight years full-time dance student at the best dance studio in Houston, Texas. She was a star. Everybody say free. 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 Not 30,000, not 20,000, not 10,000. Free. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you do that? I don't. God does. Yeah. Because I'm working on a heavenly bank account, and the more I do, the more God says, you know what? Let's let's keep him encouraged. Get get that bank account going, man. Get this thing laid up. He's just helping people, blessing people. I've paid people's rent, given people cars. I've done more things for people. I used to give away, I, I don't keep track anymore. I used to give away at least $2,000, $3,000 a year to people for whatever. They just, they can't pay the light bill. They've got this problem. They're three payments behind on their car. And I help people all over the world. 
I even help people when I go on mission trips. I take a whole bunch of extra money and pass it out to people that need this. Pastor's building a house and he's it stopped construction because they ran out of money and I give him a few hundred dollars American, which is like to them, that's like 25 grand or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Amen. So I'm always giving and helping and loving and providing for others, and God's always wanting to help me, and so he just keeps blessing me and blessing me and blessing me and crazy stuff, miraculous stuff. And some people have been confused, and I was even accused in one church where I was preaching, and I told a bunch of stories about what all God had done. You're just one of those prosperity preachers. You're just preaching about money because you want to take all of our money. I said, well, clearly you didn't hear anything I said. Yeah. Because I'm not preaching prosperity. I'm preaching the word of God. Amen. And God is a prosperous God. And he, he will let you do. I mean, he, he's happy for you to have a house. He's happy for you to have a car. You know how hard it would be for God to provide me with a house? Yeah. You know, if you swatted, like you swatted a fly... He could give me a house easier than that. Yeah. I'm not concerned. I'm 68. Never owned my house. I don't care. <laughs> you know what I care about? Amen. Amen. I said, God, I want to be anointed to preach your word. Yeah. And I want to have revelation. I want to understand that. I don't want to just read it. Yeah. I want to understand it and be able to break it down. And make people see clearly this is what God is doing. Yeah. And he said, well, is that all you want? I said, that's all I need. And he took me at my word, and that's all I've been getting. Now, if there comes a time when I need to get a house, he'll bless me supernaturally, and I'll have a house. Yeah. Okay? One time we made a list, and we are going on this ministry trip and hit several cities. I made a list. I said, dear... Somebody said, you know, if you're praying, you need to make a list so you can check them off when God gives them to you. And I put down, I need a new pair of boots, and I need a new wristwatch. And we put like seven things on that list. We went on a two-week trip, and we got home, guess what? Six of the seven things God provided for free. Guy said, man, I just bought these fancy boots. They're just a hair tight on my feet. Try one on. I tried it on. I said, Woo! That feels like heaven. He says, they're yours, brother. They're yours. Another guy said, you know, I got a watch collection. I got so many watches, I just don't know what to do. Come over, pick out one of these. Pick out one of these new watches. You know, you got a collection, so you're not wearing them. They're just all lined up in this little box. I said, well, how about this one? He says, okay. And I got a new watch. And I got six of the seven things, Bishop Renner did, in two weeks. From people who didn't know that I had a need and I didn't ask anybody for anything. They just volunteered and gave me the stuff. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I'm not sure I can live like that. Well, you don't have to live like that. You can negotiate with God. Come now, let us reason together, yes. saith the Lord. You negotiate with God. Amen. How do you want your life to go? What kind of lifestyle do you want to live? Amen. That's right. You know, the big money's around the, the big demons around the big money, you say, well, I just want to have a lot of money so I can bless all my family. Oh, Lord. Okay, but be careful because, you know, of all the people that won the lotto, 50% of them said it completely destroyed their life, destroyed their marriage, destroyed their family, destroyed their health. They were completely ruined. They got $5 million and it ruined their life and they might as well just be dead. Yeah. And they hate it. They hate everything. They hate everybody and everything. They just ruined them. They're just ruined for life. Never be right again. The big demons are around the big money. Lord. And you let two or three hundred thousand dollars float by here in a little satchel, and you'd see some people scurrying around in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. I believe that God wants to challenge us today. Amen. Do you believe that he's a rewarder? Yes. Yes. Do you realize that you're laying up treasures? Yes. In the same sense of the natural that you could be laying up things and putting them in the safe or whatever you do with your things that are precious to you. I got a little ring. I didn't buy the ring. It was my dad's ring. He paid $1,200 for it 50 years ago. 
and my mom gave it to me. I didn't have to buy it. I would never go buy a diamond ring. If I had a million dollars, I wouldn't buy a fancy diamond ring. But I would receive one from my father who loved me. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm not talking about being greedy. I'm not talking about wanting other people's stuff. You know the scripture where Paul says over in Corinthians, one says I'm a Paul, one says I'm a Paulus, and one says I'm a you know, Peter, and all that. You know what he says? He says, hey, 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 wait, don't do that. He said, every man or woman is working for their very own yeah. reward. Yeah. Yeah. And God rewards them individually. He yeah. doesn't say, okay, all of you get this reward. No, everybody has their own proposition. I don't want to be you, and you shouldn't want to be me. I'm telling you, it's a little tougher than you might think. Yeah. Amen. 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 And I'm not kidding. Mm. I could tell you sad stories and we'd all cry, oh, poor, poor Dr. McKinney, oh, Lord, have mercy, that was horrible. But I won't. I just counted all joy. <laughs> I get to preach and love people, drive around the country, go on mission trips. I love it. I love it. I couldn't love it anymore. I went with a friend of mine to, on a missions trip to Africa. We got to one country and they wouldn't sign, they wouldn't stamp our passport and visa papers and all. No. I said, well, why not? They said, well, the pastors that were hosting you, they were supposed to have their stuff in six weeks in advance and they were late. I said, well, how far in advance did they have it in? Five weeks. I said, so for that, they were the papers in order? Yeah, everything's in order. I said, well, then can't you stamp our stuff? No, I'm not going to do it. I said, but if you don't stamp our papers, that makes us here in your country illegally. Yes. I said, and that means we could be subject to arrest at any moment. Yes. And that means that if you hear that we're out at a church having a meeting, you're going to come and shut down the meeting and arrest us. Yes. Now you're catching on, Reverend. I thought, Lord, have mercy. And my poor friend, he was about five years older than me, and he tended to be, you know, meticulous about everything, and <coughs> law, law keeper. He had a fake bill that he got at the bank. And I said, well, you didn't fake it. You didn't print it. You could tell it wasn't real. Wasn't even that good a copy. I said, just spend it. Let somebody else worry about it. No, brother. I have to take it home to the United States and go to the bank where I got it and talk to the bank manager. And I said, that's way too much trouble. Just spend the thing and let somebody else worry about it. This guy was a, a real stickler. And he was so concerned. We came in. We were there a week. And every day we came back and said, are you sure we can't get those things stamped? We went to see the mayor of the city. We went to see the... Uh, the U.S. consulate or whatever the officials were from the U.S. We went to see the chief of police. Every day we came in and we got the same story. We're sorry, we're not going to stamp your papers and you're still here illegally, so you better be careful that you don't get put in prison. And some of those jails in some of those countries are pretty hard to get out of. A lot easier to get in than it is to get out. Amen. So... By the time we got on that plane heading for home, he was as gray. He looked like death warmed over. I said, brother, are you okay? I'll be okay. I just need to get home and rest. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. He got home. We got home on a Thursday. Yeah. He had a guest speaker on Friday. A speaker they'd known for years. The guy preached. After church, they went home. His wife had cooked a roast and all that, all that stuff in the oven. And they sat down there in the living room. And this pastor said to the guy, Who are you? And the evangelist said, Well, you know me. I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Who are you? Well, I'm your pal. We just got done preaching over at the church. He said, What church? The church you're pastoring, man. The church... 
your pastor. And he says, well, you need to leave my house. I don't know who you are. I don't even know what church you're talking about. Wow. The guy had a massive yeah. stroke right on the spot. He went to the hospital. The next day, he had a heart attack. He got out, he exercised, took his pills, and did everything he could for about six months. He had another heart attack and died. The stress of that trip, without, and I'm not exaggerating, it was a very difficult trip. There was victory all around, but there was also opposition all around. Very stressful, <laughs> high intensity. The stress of that trip killed that man. Yeah. And he'd been on a dozen missions trips before. But not anything like this. This was so stressful, it killed him. What I'm saying is that God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Don't expect that your life is going to be a bowl of berries every day. Mm -hmm. But you keep looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Yes. And you keep laying up treasures in heaven. And you keep loving people, love your pastor, and love your friends, and love your spouse, and love your children, and forgive your dog if he messes on the carpet. Don't beat him in the head. He doesn't know any better. Train him to do something. Hire that guy on TV, the dog whisperer, to come and work with that pup. Don't kick his brains out. Try and work with God and try and work with the Holy Spirit and lay up some treasures. And then you have a decision to make when you've got something laid up. You've got to make the decision. Well, do I want to pull any of that out and take care of some things and make my life easier? Yeah. I remember the first time I ever rode in a car that had air conditioner. Yes, I am that old. <laughs> Back in the 60s, most cars didn't have an air conditioner. But by the time you got in the 70s, everybody's car had air conditioner, just about. I can remember back when driving the car a long distance across the road, was very tedious. It was hot and sweaty and swell up all over. Oh, I'm dying with this heat. But you have a decision to make. Decision one, if you're not born again, you need to get born again. Most of you people, I've seen your faces. I've prayed for you. Most of the people in this room are born again. So I'm not going to pursue that in particular. But as born-again children of God, yeah. we have an account. You say, well, how much is in my account? I don't know. I don't know what you've been doing. I don't know if you've been loving on your wife or beating her. I don't know if you're good to the dog or kick it. I don't know if you've been uh, running your pastor and his wife into the dirt or lifting them up in prayer. I don't know what you've been doing. Mm. I don't know if you steal stuff at work or if you pray for the boss. I don't know your condition, and it's not my problem, but I'm here to tell you, whatever you got in your account, if it's $50 or $500 or $50,000, you have a decision to make. You can take out of your account if you got something in there. You got something in there anyway. You can take out of your account to make your life easier here and now. Or you can just keep doing good works and say, I don't mind. We got in a situation once where I slept on the sofa for three years. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you. We were in a situation once for six months, I slept on the floor, an oak hardwood floor, on a sleeping bag for six months. I didn't complain. Went to sleep looking in my wife's eyes and saying, I love you so much. You look like a big milkshake or an ice cream bar or something. Plate of fajitas. I love you, honey. I'm not complaining. Everybody say he's not complaining. I'm just telling you. You can either accept, accept things in stride or you could say, oh, no, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask, beg God, oh, God, help me do this and help my life to be easier. The truth is, I don't need my life to be easier. Mm. Yeah. I need more blessings from God. Yeah. Yeah. And so to do that, amen, amen. to do that, all I got to do is keep putting in my heavenly bank account. Make it a deposit. You go in the bank, they say, deposit or withdrawal. I say, make it a deposit. Mm. Now the difference is, 
When you make a withdrawal from your heavenly bank account, Jesus is happy either way. When you go to the bank, when you make a deposit, everybody in the bank's grinning. Yeah. When you come in and say, I want to take 5000 out, I'm cleaning my account out all of it. Closing an account? Mm. Taking all the money? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and everybody looks like, this is so bad. This is so bad. You know? yeah. right. But God's not that way. Yeah. You can put the money in and then it's yours. You can take it out here or take it with you. You can get your blessings now. You can get them later. Amen. You can do it however you want to do it. Yeah. Everybody say it's my decision. It's my decision. <laughs> if you're not born again, everything you do from mowing the lawn to feeding the dog is a sin. Because yeah. you can't do anything else. But if the Holy Spirit lives in you, everything you do is pulsating back and forth between you and the Holy Spirit, just like a heartbeat. Amen. Boom, 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 boom. Amen. In the movies, when they want to get you excited and they're building up for the scene of the murder or the rape or some terrible thing that's really exciting, they start the beat like a normal heartbeat. Boom, boom, boom. And as intensity builds, the music speeds up. Boom, 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 boom. And your heartbeat tends to race right along with that beat. And you're so excited, you're about to bust a gut, oh, and it's just a bunch of fake, silly actors. Yeah. <laughs> silly people. And if you knew how wicked and perverted and silly they were, oh, Lord. You, when they came on there, you'd say, get that filthy, oh. reprobated scum off of that oh. program. Lord, have mercy. Mm. <laughs> a guy who hobnobs with a lot of rich movie stars told me once, he said, nobody knows the struggles. He said, these people are wicked and demonic. Wow. Half of them worship Satan and they're all kinds of crazy. He said, they're fighting the bill collectors all the time. So I asked the guy, I said, well, how are you doing? He said, well, I owe 140000 on my American Express card just for this month. Mm. And he said, I've got about a hundred grand in the bank. I'm about 40 grand short for this month. And I gotta figure out how to get an interview or something on TV and get some more cash flow moving. And so rich people have the same struggles that we do. It's just they have enough money to get into more trouble than we get into. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, somebody drank all my water, so I'm winding it down. <laughs> Has anybody gotten anything out of yes. this? Yeah. Hallelujah. I sure love my wife. She's cuter than a speckled pup, I'm telling you. And I do love speckled puppies. We've had a bunch of speckled puppies raised a few litters in our day. Hallelujah. I love animals. I love God. I love people. I don't, I don't love snakes, but I do like snakes, I confess. When I was a boy, I was always catching snakes. I had pet snakes took groundhogs and possums and stuff to school to show and tell. Always had some kind of animal. I'm always nursing it back to health, you know. Found a, a big red-tailed hawk with an injured wing and I'm trying to nurse it back to health. And if you'll let the compassion of Christ rise up within you, not only will you be good to animals, you'll even start to love who? People. And if you can love people, what else can you do? Yeah. You can love yourself. Yeah. You say, how can you love me when I've been a dirty rat? doesn't make any difference. Yeah. If Jesus washed you in the blood, your sins are forgiven past, present, and yes. future. future. So then are you a dirty rat? No. no. You're a child of God yes. washed in the blood of Jesus. Yes. And I'm working on putting some stuff in my heavenly bank account by loving my pastor, loving my neighbor, loving my children, loving my boss at work. It's a wonderful thing when your boss comes to you and says, there's been a problem in our family. Can you pray with me? That's a good feeling. Yeah. That's a good feeling. But when they know that you're walking with God, now it puts a different spin on everything that you do.